Who's pumped up? I don't even play soccer. I'm ready to go, though, right? If you don't know who that was, that was Hervé Renard. I hope I said that right. Uh, He's a French former soccer player who's now the head coach of the Saudi Arabian soccer team. And that was their first match in this most recent World Cup. They were down 1-0 to against the eventual champions, the betting favorite of the World Cup, the Argentinian national football team. And they're, they're losing one to zero. And he gives this incredible, impassioned speech to his team where, in one sense, he's, he's being hard and correcting them. But in another sense, he's saying, do you not feel that we're able to come back? Do you not feel that something could happen here? And the miraculous happened. The Saudi Arabian team scored two goals coming right out of halftime and held on to win two to one against Argentina, pulling off what most consider the greatest upset in World Cup history. Right? So how amazing is that? That 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 little moment of halftime changed the course of that game. And and I think that's why I love halftime speeches. They get me riled up, right? You can just Google halftime speeches on YouTube and you just feel pumped up. And I love New Year's because I I feel like New Year's is a halftime for us. Right? New Year's is a moment to reflect and look back, realize where we're at, and refocus and reset as we move forward to change some of our action, but to even change some of our attitude. And the passage that we're going to read this morning in 2 Timothy, to me, it feels like a halftime speech. I mean, Paul's using language that's, I mean, it's pretty intense. It's pretty fiery. And he's trying to to reset Timothy's attitude, his mind, and he's trying to redirect his focus as Timothy goes on for the rest of his ministry career. And so I want to embrace this morning as this is our halftime. As we look at this text, this is going to be our halftime. We're going to ask God, how do we need to have a reset? Where does our focus need to shift as 2023 begins? So if you have your Bibles, open them to 2 Timothy chapter 2. That's where we're going to be today. Uh, and I also recognize that there are kids in the room. My own kids are in the room. I love it. Bring it on. If they're making noise, it doesn't bother me. Maybe it bothers your neighbor, but I'm cool with it. So uh, let's enjoy this morning together. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, here's a little bit of the context. Paul is towards the end of his life. He's chained up in prison, and he's writing to Timothy, who is his protege, and kind of carrying on the ministry that Paul started. And so this is the second of two letters that he wrote to Timothy. And we're in chapter two, verses one through 13. So Paul begins by saying in verse one, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace. That phrase is what this whole passage is about, about being strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. So we really need to understand what does it mean to be strong in grace? How do we be strong in grace? And really, I think we need to define the word grace. And often if you ask people, hey, what does grace mean? They're going to give you this answer, unmerited favor. And that's, that's certainly true, right? There's definitely an aspect of grace that is unmerited favor, right? The forgiveness of our sins, the salvation that we've received is grace. And we did not deserve that. But there's a second definition to grace that is used throughout the Bible constantly. And often we as believers, we just kind of miss it. We don't think about grace in this way. And I think the grace that Paul's talking about is the second form of grace. So I'm going to pull up the Britannica definition of grace in Christian theology, because it's actually amazing. I'm, I'm really impressed by Britannica here. So Britannica says that grace is the spontaneous, unmerited gift, there it is, of the divine favor and the salvation of sinners, And here's part two, the divine influence operating in individuals for their regeneration and sanctification. Isn't that powerful? Britannica got it right. (laughs) And we don't sometimes. Grace is the divine power that's at work within us that it doesn't just save us, but it allows us to work out our salvation. John Piper puts it like this. Grace is not only a disposition or a quality or an inclination in the nature of God, but it is an influence or a force or a power or an acting of God that works within us to change our capacities for work, suffering, which we'll talk about, and obedience. So it's the grace of God that enables us to live the life that God has called us to live. Apart from his grace, 
we cannot live as he has called us to. It's the grace within us through the Holy Spirit. So here's a very simple way to think about it. By the grace of God, we have life. And by the grace of God, we live it. Right? By the grace of God, we have life. We have been risen from the dead. And by the grace of God, we live the life that he gave us. Okay, so keep that thought in mind as we keep going, because Paul told Timothy to be strong in this grace as he carries out his salvation. Verse two, Paul goes on to say, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. And now th there's debate, it, you know, was, was Paul basically telling Timothy, hey, set up your pastoral successor? Maybe. Or was he just saying, in general, pass on the teachings of Jesus to all people so that they can all pass it down? Maybe. Both would be good, right? And we recognize this as a church. We have to pass down the way of Jesus, like for, for your kids or for the, the people that you're discipling, maybe your younger coworkers, we need to pass on the way of Jesus to the younger generations. Newsflash, the culture, the enemy, the world, they're putting all of their money, energy, and effort towards teaching the 10 to 25-year-olds roughly in our nation their own way of life with a lot of passion, with a lot of money, with a lot of vigor, they are trying to teach the younger generations. We as the church not only just need to match that level of intensity with teaching the younger generations, but even surpass that intensity. We don't want to lose the younger generations to the world's way of life. We want to pass on the way of Jesus. It's why I'm really excited, selfless, selfless plug. Later in the spring, we're going to do a 10-week series called The Questions, where we're going to take some time to address really difficult questions where the world is trying to provide answers that are contrary to this book. And we're going to talk about the importance of us knowing those answers from a biblical perspective and how to pass them down to the younger generation. So for all of us in this room, we must be passing down the way of Jesus to the younger generations. If you're not making disciples in this room, it's a new year and you can do that this year. Start fresh and make disciples this year. So be strong in grace, pass on the way of Jesus. Verse three, Paul goes on, join with me in suffering. Join with me in suffering. Okay, let, let's talk about this word suffering, right? Uh, suffering's really fun. Uh, we all go through it. Usually never feels good. Um, we can try and escape it. We in America definitely try to escape it, but ultimately we can't fully escape it. Uh, and the Bible has a lot to say about suffering, actually. And I could have picked out many passages, but I, I want to highlight one from 1 Peter 4, because I feel like it really illustrates what Paul was trying to communicate to Timothy about suffering. So Peter says this to the believers. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, right? So basically, don't be surprised when you're going through suffering, when trials are happening, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So he's using very active language here, participating in the sufferings of Jesus. And we often view suffering as this thing that's just out there and it happens to us and we just need to do our best to kind of persevere in suffering and just kind of deal with it as we go. And, and that's certainly true in many ways, right? There are oftentimes we're not inviting suffering into our life and it just kind of happens. That's the, that's the result of living in a sinful, broken, fallen world. But I want to, I want to, plea with you that from a biblical perspective, we are not only passive recipients of suffering, we are active partners in suffering. Okay, we're not just passive recipients of suffering, we are active partners in suffering. Romans 8, right, we, we are to participate in the sufferings of Jesus so that we may participate in his glory in the days to come. You make decisions as a believer every day that bring about your suffering, and we're called to. Right? I mean, th think about some of these. When you tithe, you're giving away some of the money that you earned and not spending it on yourself. That's a little bit of suffering, right? 
What about when you're making disciples? That takes time. It takes energy. It, it takes relationship and usually a little bit of money too. There's a little bit of suffering involved with that. What about the avoidance of sin? Right? The world is getting to just go revel and do whatever they want and enjoy whatever they want. We as believers, we don't do that. We actively choose to suffer by not doing some of the things that the world does. And even take the example of what about uprooting your family and moving halfway across the world to spread the gospel to an unreached people group? That's an active choice in suffering. So we as believers, we are to be active partners in suffering, knowing that Jesus made an active choice to come and suffer on our behalf. Therefore, we make active choices to suffer on Christ's behalf and on everyone else's behalf so that all may come to know Jesus, right? That's our role to play in suffering. So Paul's going to go on to explain what it means to join with him or partner with him in suffering. And he gives three examples uh, three kind of world examples that we can relate to when it comes to suffering. So let's read this verse three and four. He says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. So our first example that we have here is the example of a soldier. See, a soldier, as we build this list, a soldier does not get entangled in civilian affairs, but rather they please their commanding officer officer, right? Now that word entangled doesn't mean that a soldier doesn't do normal things, right? Soldiers can go to the grocery store too. Uh, soldiers have to go to the bathroom too. Soldiers do normal everyday stuff, but a soldier is always a soldier, right? And a soldier is always representing something and someone bigger than themselves. And a soldier knows when my commanding officer gives me instruction, I don't hesitate, I don't second guess. I do it immediately because I know that the commands given to me by my officer are not only to save my life, but to save the lives of my brothers and sisters. So a soldier knows it's important that I please my commanding officer because it's for my benefit and for other people's benefit too that we do that. Soldiers are in a war. They're in a battle. They're in a fight. They've got a... a an intensity to them, knowing what they are facing day in and day out. And I kind of have a question. Do we as the church sell the fact that we're in a war? Do we sell the fact that when you sign up to follow Jesus, you're signing up to be a soldier? That in order to follow Jesus faithfully day by day, you will experience battles and trials and hardships like you never thought you would. That there will be a, a uh, demons and Satan that are trying to destroy your life and your family, and that you will have to fight. Do we sell that? I think in some ways we do, but in some ways maybe we miss it. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna read you something that I pulled from a, a pretty large church's website about what they're selling at their church. Kind of like their info page. It says, "Here's what you'll find at our." church, okay? And, and what I'm about to read is pretty common amongst a lot of churches if you look at what their website says about what they're selling when it comes to Christianity. So what you'll find is this, a casual atmosphere, friendly people to help you find your way around, live music, high-impact media presentations, messages relevant to your daily life, an amazing children's ministry, a friendly hospitality area where you can relax, recharge, and relate in your comfort zone with a coffee and donut in your hand. That you matter to God and to blank church. And here's, here's the ironic thing. Right underneath this list, there's a mission statement. It says this, we strive to become the kind of church described in the Bible. And I don't remember hearing donuts and coffee described in the Bible. And I love donuts. And a lot of you love the coffee. I don't drink coffee, but a lot of you love the coffee that's out there. And none of those things are inherently wrong, but that's what's being sold on the website, right? By way of comparison, here's the Navy SEAL code. Loyalty to country, team, and teammate. Serve with honor and integrity on and off the battlefield. Ready to lead, ready to follow, never quit. 
Take responsibility for your actions and the actions of your teammates. Excel as warriors through discipline and innovation. Train for war, fight to win, defeat our nation's enemies, earn your trident every day. Now, with the exception of having to earn our trident, I would say the SEAL code has a lot more biblical language than what the church was selling on its website, right? There's a lot more biblical language that the Navy is using. And often as a church, we're not selling the fact that we're in a war. We're we're trying to achieve comfort as the church. Imagine the Navy using the church's way of selling themselves. Hey, come join the Navy. We'll give you good health care. It'll be, we'll have lounge areas, a basketball court. Um, It'll be fun. We'll provide food for you. You'd have a lot of soft soldiers, right? And I think there's a lot of soft Christians because we as a church maybe aren't doing the best at selling the war and selling the battle that we're in. That's why Francis Chan has this quote that I love. He says, by catering our worship to the worshipers and not to the object of our worship, I fear we have created human-centered churches. That's the danger, right? If, If we try and make our churches just this comfortable place where it's just all about being happy together and not recognizing the fact that we are soldiers together fighting a war in our day-to-day lives. We could create a self-centered church where we're a bunch of soft Christians. But we're not called to be soft Christians. We're called to be soldiers engaging in this war. And as a soldier, we will suffer. But if we fight well, we please God. Let's Look at the next example, verse five. Paul goes on to say, similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So as we build this list, we look at a soldier, then we have an athlete. We compete according to the rules. And if we do, we win the victor's crown. We strive to at least. And the reason I put rules in quotations is because when I initially read this, my my first thought was, oh yeah, an athlete has to compete according to the rules. Like if I'm playing basketball, I can't just pick up the ball and run with it, right? Like that's against the rules. I won't win if I do that. Um, and that certainly is true, right? There are, there are do's and don'ts for us as a Christian that we need to operate according to the biblical rules. Um, but actually what Paul is referencing here is, is a deeper level of this. So in the Greek Olympic games, which Paul would have been referencing here, What they would do, if you wanted to be an Olympic athlete in the the ancient Greek Olympics, you had to sign up, literally contract yourself to be in a 10-month training session before the games even took place. So like almost the entire year, you are in training. And what it meant for you to be in training is that you you spent most of that time separated from all the other people. You had your own area and your own way of life. You were put on a very strict diet, a very strict workout regimen, and you had to fulfill that contract. And if you didn't fulfill that 10-month contract or if you broke the rules in some way, you would be disqualified from even competing in the Greek games. So what Paul is saying here is that as an athlete, they have to suffer by signing up for this really long trial of, of training And there's a lot of do's and don'ts within it. And they have to do all that just to be able to compete. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it all to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever, our eternal crown. Therefore, I don't run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer that's just beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body. I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So Paul himself is using this language. I have put myself under intense training to spread the gospel as an athlete for Jesus, knowing that I will receive a victorious crown one day in eternity. And that's why I do it, so that other people may know Jesus. So I I wanna, continuing on this this way of comparison, I just wanna bring up some quotes from some of the most famous athletes of our time. I would argue some of the five greatest athletes of our time. And I wanna be inspired because it's easy to see these athletes and see their success and miss what it took for them to get where they 
are, right? Athletes live in luxury now, but it wasn't always that way. They had to suffer to get to where they are. So starting with Messi, uh, this is Lionel Messi, arguably the greatest soccer player of all time. When asked what it took for him to become an overnight sensation when he was the youngest player ever to start for the Barcelona team, he said this, I start early and I stay late. Day after day after day, year after year. It took me 17 years and 114 days to become an overnight success. I love that, right? The irony of that. Oh, yeah, an overnight success? Yeah, it only took me 17 and a half years to become the overnight success. What about Michael Jordan, arguably the best basketball player of all time? He says this, every time I feel tired while I'm exercising and training, I close my eyes to see that picture, to see that list with my name. This usually motivates me to work again. All right, so for Michael Jordan, it's the vision of victory that enables him to to keep going. It motivates him to keep training and exercising. What about Usain Bolt, the fastest man to ever live? Says easy is not an option. No days off, never quit. Be fearless, talent you have naturally. Skill is only developed by hours and hours of work. Usain Bolt was born fast, but he was not born the fastest man alive. That took hours and hours of work. What about Tom Brady, TB12, arguably the greatest winner in football history? Uh, He had this famous response when asked, what is your favorite ring? He said, the next one. He's looking towards the prize. That's why he's still playing when he's 45 years old. That, that applies to us as believers. Do we quit? Or do we continue to see the prize and go at it year after year, regardless of our age? And then what about Muhammad Ali, arguably the greatest sports icon of the 20th century? He said this, I hated every minute of training, but I said, don't quit. Suffer now and live the rest of your life as a champion. How many of us need to hear that in this room? Suffer now, live the rest of your life as a champion. Suffer now, live eternity in victory. Suffer now on this earth, receive all the rewards your father has planned for you in eternity. We can suffer now because we know what's coming. Muhammad Ali suffered knowing what was coming to him. We can do the same. Do we live like this? Do we suffer like this? Do we have our eyes set on eternity like these athletes have their eyes set on victory? We suffer as soldiers. We suffer as athletes. And the last example that Paul gives is one of a farmer. He says in verse six and seven, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying. The Lord will give you insight into all of this. So as we finish out our list, we've got a soldier, we've got an athlete, and we've got a farmer. And farmers, if we work hard, if we suffer through our hard work, we will receive the first share of crops. So there's a lot of farmers out there, right? There's quiet farmers, there's loud farmers, boisterous farmers, there's rude farmers, there's funny farmers, small farmers, and strong farmers. You know what you've never met? A lazy farmer, right? You've never met a lazy farmer. You know what a lazy farmer is? Me. Proverbs 24 says this, those too lazy to plow in the right season will have no food at the harvest. If you don't work, you don't farm, right? Right? If you don't work, you don't farm. And farmers suffer. They work constantly day in, day out, wake up early, stay late. They're constantly preparing their fields, caring for their animals. It never stops. In season, out of season, they're always putting in their best efforts, not only to provide a living for their own family, but to also feed all of us. How incredible is that? And and here's probably the hardest part for a farmer. You can put in tons of work week after week, month after month, and it all be ruined by something that's completely out of your control, right? We don't control the weather. A farmer doesn't control the weather and their work could be destroyed by something outside of their control. That's suffering, right? Farmers, they have to work hard if they wanna succeed. But we as a nation, we're trending away from hard work. 
right? It's been happening for a while, but COVID has even expedited this process. But I, I want to read to you this fascinating quote from Mike Rowe, who did Dirty Jobs, if you remember that show. I love that show. He has a quote from 2010, mind you. Okay, so this is 12, 13 years ago that he said this. Our collective definition of a good job has evolved into something that no longer resembles work. And that has detached us from many great things, including our food and the people who provide it. We've spent decades trying to distance ourselves from traditional notions of work and who embodies work more than the American farmer. All right, so here you have Mike Rowe observing what's going on in 2010, saying that we as a nation, we're distancing ourselves from traditional work, work that is just gritty, work that's hard, that's day in and day out. And you hear it now, right? You say you have a good job when you get paid to not work very hard, right? That, that's kind of the, the language that we use as a culture. But the reality is we're missing out. There are so many benefits in working hard and it's suffering, it's tough. But when we work hard, any farmer will tell you, you will receive the first share of your own crops. You will be the first to experience the benefits of your own hard work. So are we suffering through our hard work? And I'm not suggesting that we be workaholics, but advancing the kingdom is hard work. It doesn't just happen through osmosis. It happens through our work. Are we working as farmers to advance the kingdom. So let's recap. Paul instructed Timothy to suffer as a soldier, as an athlete, and as a farmer. To, to please the commanding officer, to win the crown, and to receive the first fruits of his labor. And now, this isn't easy, right? This is not easy. Suffering isn't fun. Soldiers get shot at. Their friends get taken and destroyed. They are constantly in fear of what could happen to them. They're separated from family and loved ones. They have to undergo strict orders and they're under high stress situations. Athletes' bodies deteriorate. Their bodies are in pain. They're injured. They have to be careful with what they eat and what they, what they do and what they don't do. Every decision bears a big impact for an athlete and farmers have to constantly put in the work knowing that it could all be gone in one moment because of something outside of their control. It is not easy for us as believers to suffer like a soldier, athlete, and farmer. We have friends who've been taken away from the faith. We've lost loved ones physically. Sickness destroys our own bodies and the bodies of those that we love. We have limits to us as a human that are frustrating at times. We put in work and sometimes we don't see the output. There's plenty of suffering that we have all experienced that you experience in 2022 that you're going to experience in 2023. You're going to be under attack. You're going to feel fatigued and pain and sickness and you're gonna work hard and sometimes not know where the fruits of that labor is. But how do we do this well? How do we persevere in suffering well? How do we be a good soldier and good athlete and good farmer? I wanna go back to how Paul started this passage about being strong in the grace of Christ Jesus. It's only by God's grace that we will persevere in suffering. It's only by God's grace that you will persevere in the difficult relationships that exist in your life, in the cancer that you have been dealt with, in the, the death of a loved one, in the, the hard work of your day-to-day -day job of advancing the kingdom, of being a father or mother, the, the suffering of broken relationships that exist. It will only be by God's grace that you will persevere in that suffering. If you do it by your own strength, you will fall flat on your own face. Suffering pulls us into God's grace like nothing else that exists in this world. The great uh, British preacher Charles Spurgeon had this to say about suffering and grace. I'm certain that I never did grow in grace one half so much anywhere as I have upon the bed of pain. Charles Spurgeon knew pain and suffering. He dealt with lots of physical health sufferings. And for him, he said, nothing drew me to the grace of God more than my own pain, than my own suffering. Charles Spurgeon grew in grace because of his suffering. 
So the question for us is, well, how did he access that grace? How do we access God's grace in our suffering? If we are to be strong in God's grace in the midst of us suffering as a soldier, athlete, and farmer, how do we do it? What's the key to accessing God's grace? Paul goes on to tell Timothy and tell us the answer. Verse eight, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. Is it really that simple? Remember Jesus Christ. How? How do we remember him? Raised from the dead. Descended from David. Remember that he is risen and that he is reigning. He rose from the dead. He's reigning as our king on the throne. Paul's saying, if we want to suffer well and persevere in God's grace, we have to remember Jesus Christ and not just Jesus Christ crucified, but we look beyond the cross and we look to the crown. Jesus in heaven, risen, reigning over all of creation. It gives us insight into our future, not just the grace that we have been saved from our sins, but the grace that we have a future that we get to move towards in Jesus Christ. Paul says, this is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. And even though Paul himself is chained, he says, God's word is not chained. For Paul, he can persevere in his suffering. He can be content even though he's in chains because God's word will accomplish what it set out to. And Paul, in his chains, can speak the words of God, knowing that they will fulfill the promises that God has given. So we too can persevere, knowing that ultimately it's not up to us. God will accomplish what he said he would. Therefore, Paul says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So Paul's saying, I have experienced the love and salvation and life that I've found in Jesus. And I am willing to endure everything because I know that Christ is risen and reigning. His word will accomplish what it set out to. And I want everyone else called by God to know this Jesus too. Christ suffered for me, I'll suffer for them so that they may know Jesus. Paul goes on to say, or a quote, actually, this this poem or this saying. Maybe it was a song back in the day. He says, here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. So I just want to pause there real quick, right? We just talked about Jesus who is risen and reigning. And Paul just says right here, if we die with him, we will also rise with him. And if we endure through our suffering, we will also reign with him. So not only does Jesus, is is he risen and reigning, but we too will rise and reign with him. And then he gives a warning. He says, if we disown him, he will also disown us. Jesus said those same words. He says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot disown himself. And now this, this fourth part here, There's actually a lot of debate, and I went into this thinking one thing and realized there's actually a lot of possible conclusions for this last phrase. I'll just throw them out pretty quickly. Um, One, what I've thought my whole life is that when we are faithless in terms of making mistakes, God is still faithful to save us in spite of our mistakes. And certainly we can know that that's true, that our salvation is not dependent on us keeping a sinful life or sinless life. Um, The the second way that we could take this is a lot more negative, that if we have no faith, God will be faithful to condemn us, that God has promised to condemn those that don't have faith, and God will be faithful to keep that promise as well, uh, which certainly could be true. But I actually think it's this third one, after after studying a little bit. Um, Basically, that though some who claim Christ fall away, though they originally claim faith and then fall away, that does not nullify God's faithfulness or change who he is. And the reason that I think that that might be true is Romans 3, 2 through 4. It says this, Paul's own words, talking about the Jews who were called by God, but were faithless with that calling. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Were there, will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being be a liar. In other words, If those who are called by God fall away, that doesn't change anything about who he is or God as a promise keeper. So 
pick whichever one you want to land on. Regardless, what we can take from that poem is that there are promises for those who know Jesus and there's warnings for those who don't, right? The determinator is, do you know Jesus? We can either choose to suffer now and reign forever or we can reign now and suffer forever. The question is, do you know Jesus? So I want to go back to that original question that we had asked. How do we access God's grace in our suffering? By remembering that Christ is risen and reigning and that we too will rise and reign. How easy is it to forget? How easy is it to be in your day-to-day life, to experience day-to-day suffering, for things to not go as well as you want them to, for sickness and all these things to come into our life and to forget that Jesus not only rose from the dead, but actually is reigning in heaven right now. How easy is it to forget? And how much do we need to remember Jesus risen and reigning? And not just that, that we ourselves will rise and reign with him. Guys, we know the ending to our story. We can persevere through anything because we know what's to come. One day there will be a day where there will be no more death or mourning or pain or crying for the old order of things will pass away. That's what we get to look forward to because Jesus is risen and reigning. We will rise and reign with him. Therefore, we can endure all sorts of suffering by the grace of God as we remember Jesus Christ. So as we close, I want to give you some tools to help you remember Jesus because it's, Again, really easy to forget Jesus. But here's a list of tools that will help you remember Jesus in your day-to-day life. Reading this book will help you remember who Jesus is and the story that you are caught up in. Prayer, praying and talking to and with God. Solitude, spending time listening to God. Worship, singing songs of truth over yourselves and others and with Others, community, being in close relationship with other believers will help you remember Jesus. Coming to church will help you remember Jesus. Giving of your time, energy, and resources. Serving, making disciples, and any other spiritual discipline that you want to add to this list. All spiritual disciplines are little acts that remind us of who Christ is. They give us access to his grace that empowers us to live the life that he's called us to and to suffer well. And without these spiritual disciplines, we will forget Jesus, we will forget our destiny, and we will not suffer well. We will just be passive recipients hoping the suffering ends rather than suffering as a good soldier, athlete, and farmer by the grace of God. So because this is our halftime, I wanna give a moment of pause Here's our 2023 reset. Here's our halftime. How will you, in 2023, remember the risen and reigning Christ? What will you do to remember the risen and reigning Christ? I'm a big fan of New Year's resolutions. Um, Some of you may not be, and that's okay. I love them simply because to have resolve or to be resolute about something is to make a firm decision. I think a lot of people make New Year's wishes or New Year's ideas or New Year's dreams. But what if we made a New Year's firm decision as a church to remember Jesus through tangible little acts that are called spiritual disciplines? If each of us just chose one, would we remember Christ more and would we suffer better by the grace of God? So I'm going to give about a minute and I want you to think and I want you to contemplate What is one small decision? Maybe you've already done this, but what is one small decision that you can make on a regular basis that will help you remember Jesus Christ, risen and reigning? So go ahead and go. Where you are, take a minute to think and ponder and ask God what you should do to remember him on a regular basis. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you would say, man, in 2022, I didn't really remember Christ very well. Maybe he's become distant to you. Maybe you've not been in relationship with him. And this morning is the opportunity for your own reset. 
to come to him. We're gonna have prayer teams around the room available for you to get prayer if you need to remember Jesus this morning. We have communion around the room, these tables where you can take and remember the body and blood of Jesus that was broken and spilled for you so that you can rise and reign with Christ one day. And maybe remembering Jesus doesn't even make sense for you because you don't even know Jesus. Maybe you need to discover the risen and reigning Jesus. Come talk to me, come talk to anybody on the prayer team. We would love to pray with you and introduce you to our loving Savior King, Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for choosing to come in the form of your son to suffer on our behalf. That you sent Jesus to be the death that we deserved. And thank you that by your grace and by your power, Jesus rose from the grave and is reigning above all of creation. We recognize you, risen and reigning King Jesus. We recognize you right now. We choose to put our eyes on you, to focus ourselves on you, to take this reset moment, to recenter our hearts and our minds and our actions on the only one that matters, you, King Jesus. May our lives be a reflection of you. May we suffer well as a good soldier, athlete, and farmer of Jesus. By your grace, may we persevere in suffering so that all may come to know you and see your glory. We look forward to the day when we will rise and reign with you. Until then, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.